A very good morning, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Foli Batibo, principal presenter at Al Jazeera English Television, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session addressing uh, the effects of climate change today, adaptation policies for a climate resilient future organized by the Qatar Fund for Development and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate your presence. Now, it's undeniable that the climate crisis is one of the most pressing issues of our time. We've seen the extraordinary destruction that it can bring, but we've also witnessed the progress that's been made over the years to address the problem. Uh, important policies are in place or in the pipeline to move and turn to more efficient and cleaner energy and uh, Important policies are in place, of course, and significant resources, most importantly, have been mobilized. But plans to prevent damage have already been outpaced by climate-induced disasters. In its latest report, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC, warns that the effects of climate change are outpacing our ability to adapt. The damage is happening faster and at lower temperature levels than scientists had previously predicted. Lives and livelihoods are being destroyed at an unprecedented rate, and it's affecting the most marginalized and worsening inequalities, especially when it comes to access to food, when it comes to access to water and energy uh, resources, of course. Some of the most vulnerable people who live from agriculture, like on my continent of Africa, are already affected. Poor rainfall, localized flooding, locust infestation, and conflicts have worsened conditions for local farmers and pastoral communities. Now, when you couple that with the impact of the pandemic and geopolitical tensions, the war in Ukraine, and the rise in fertilizer prices, <clears throat> you know, it adds up to a growing threat to global food security. So, what we're asking this morning in this session is what more can be done now to help low and middle income countries improve their climate re resilience? What more should we as a global collective do to support agricultural development and better protect communities that are already vulnerable? What solutions that will help us adapt to changes in our climate can be funded immediately. So those are some of the important questions that we'll be looking to answer during this session. Let me introduce to you our distinguished panelists. His Excellency Marcelo Ebrard is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Thank you so much. His Excellency Khalifa Jassim al Khwari is Director General of the Qatar Fund for Development. Welcome and thank you for being with us. Mr. Mark Sussman is Chief Executive Officer of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Welcome, Mr. Sussman. And last but not least, Ms. Maya Grove, Convener of the Climate Governance Commission. Thank you. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much. You've got fans in the room, it seems. <laughs> so a warm welcome to you all. Before we begin our discussion, a few words from Mr. Bill Gates co-founder of Microsoft and co-chairperson of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Unfortunately, Mr. Gates couldn't be with us in person this morning, but he had this very important message. Take a look. Your Highness, Excellencies, and distinguished guests, I'm honored to join this year's Doha Forum. Thank you to the government of Qatar for bringing us together to focus on critical global issues like climate change. To avoid a climate disaster, the world must collectively reduce its annual greenhouse gas emissions from 51 billion tons per year to zero in just the next 28 years. That's going to be tough, but I'm optimistic. If we work together now to accelerate the innovations that can get us to zero, we can get it done. But that's only one part of the job. We also need to help people around the world adapt to the climate changes already taking place. Hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers are already seeing their livelihoods and economic security threatened by higher temperatures 
and changing weather patterns. This is especially true in dryland regions like Sub-Saharan Africa that are heating more quickly and are already contending with severe food crises. In fact, nearly all of Africa is expected to reach over two degrees of warming between 2025 and 2040. Even Africa itself generates less than 5% of human-generated emissions. The good news is, if we act now to help these smallholder farmers adapt, we can not only prevent millions of people from finding poverty and hunger due to climate change, we can actually increase agricultural yields and just our equitable economic growth where it's most needed. That's why our foundation has made climate adaptation a priority. And it's why I'm proud to announce today a partnership of up to 200 million committed jointly with our friends at the Powder Fund for Development focused on agriculture, climate resilience, and economic development. The partnership is called ANMO, Growth in Arabic, and will support innovation that can help all the farmers adapt, just as important sure those tools reach those the most. Our first project together will focus on improving the livelihood of low-income farmers in multiple African countries. Through meat and eggs, poultry can be a critical source of both nutrition and income for smallholder farmers. So NANMO will explore and support ways to help farmers raise better breeds of poultry with higher yields of both. We expect NANMO to be an ambitious and long-term partnership for us, building on our long-standing collaboration with Qatar and QFFD on other economic development projects like the Lives and Livelihood Fund. Working together to support and employ game-changing innovation, I'm confident that we can help farmers navigate changing conditions, tackling the warmer climate, boosting economic growth for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Gates for his timely, insightful uh, remarks, and congratulations to the Gates Foundation and the Qatar Fund for Development on the launch of the NANMO Partnership, uh, directly supporting smallholder farmers in Africa. And we'll hear more about the initiative from uh, Mr. Khalifa and Mr. Sazman in just a few minutes. But Foreign Minister Ibrad, let me start with you if I can. A recent uh, Pew Research Center survey found that 80% of Mexicans identify climate change as the greatest threat to their country. Agricultural experts predict that parts of your country will feel the effects of climate change more than many other countries, not least because of its location between two oceans, which makes it and exposes it to weather volatility. So conditions are, are changing already for Mexican farmers. We've seen some of them switching to other crops to try and deal with the crisis. What is your government doing to mitigate, not just mitigate, but adapt to these changes that are already happening? What, what plans are in place? Well, thank you. Hello? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity to be in this panel. Thank you. Uh, I would, would like to say, in Mexico right now, we are making several investments, mainly the largest reforestation and plan to recover the, the forest of the south of the country. Uh, maybe we have right now 400,000 people working on this. And there are other, other actions, but let me introduce uh, a quick answer about the, the main question that, uh, in this panel. What can be done? Mm -hmm. what, what more can be done? In Mexico, a lot of things, absolutely. But let me uh, take an, an overview. Uh, I, I remember 10 years ago discussing how to finan finance the adaptation of the world, it, mainly in the poor countries, mainly in the island countries, maybe in the first place. And uh, we spent uh, 10 years. And the financing 
architecture that we developed together. It, it's not working. What we need. So my main point in this panel, if you allow me, is to say establish a mandatory contribution by country. Mm. Other way, it, there are no, no solutions. Mm -hmm. yes. if, if it's only uh, several different initiatives, but we don't have the dimension. We don't have enough money in order to change the adaptation trends today all over the world. Okay, contribution, which was talked about at the COP26 summit, uh, richer countries contributing more and, and keeping up but, their pledges. But what happens course. with the $100 billion? We will ask no, Maya about that. that they... We'll ask Maya about that in just a few minutes. Why are the pledges not being kept? Let me come to you, uh, Mr. Khalifa, and, and, uh, and talk to you about this new initiative that uh, the Gates Foundation and the Qatar Fund for Development have announced today. Uh, I, I know that uh, QFFFD has been financing climate change adaptation projects in Africa for a number of years now in Somalia, uh, notably. Uh, you've been involved helping vulnerable communities there achieve food security. Tell us more about NANMO, this new partnership with the Gate Foundation. What will be the focus of this initiative? What will be different from other initiatives that you've taken on until now? Thank you, Father. First, uh, I would like to maybe touch a base a little bit on what Qatar in general is doing, either uh, uh, internally, nationally, or internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, Qatar has a long-standing commitment toward uh, climate change. Uh, we have national policies that has been uh, targeted in 2030 uh, as part of our national vision. Uh, yesterday, uh, our Ministry of uh, Energy has announced or uh, has uh, signed an agreement, a global agreement, uh, to commit to reduce uh, uh, gas emission uh, to 30% by uh, 2030. Internationally as well, uh, we have been, as part of our international development uh, agenda, we have been focusing on climate change, uh, and we are taking a holistic approach uh, toward that. Uh, what I mean is, we are, we are focusing mainly on human development. But climate change affects every part of our human development activities, uh, either in our uh, educational programs, uh, health programs, uh, economic development, like the, the one that we are targeting in, in NANMO as well. And uh, His Highness the Emir recently has uh, made uh, enormous pledge as well toward, uh, toward the climate change. And it, it's become more and more it's, it's embedded practice within our, uh, all our programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the program, NANMU, uh, grow, growing, as, as Mr. Uh, Bill Gates uh, explained, uh, is an initi joint initiatives focusing on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, an area where our two-thirds of the workforce work on uh, our farmers, mm -hmm. and an area that uh, needs economic development, need food because of the uh, climate change uh, impact, an area that hasn't contributed as much to the problem. Right. And uh, our program, they're focused on a small scale farmers, trying to, trying to give them the tools that, you know, for now they have a lot of uh, post-harvesting post -harvest, losses. They have low productivities because of many reasons, and, and the climate changes on top, uh, right. on top of those reasons. So what's trying to do is give them tools to develop, let them to develop and scale up products, uh, new services, mm -hmm. policies, and system-wide innovation within uh, the uh, economic, economic development. We target small farmers and women uh, within that uh, group to uh, to provide them with the services to, for, for them to, to nourish uh, their families, especially when it comes to smallholders. They are very, they are very small uh, entities. So we wish that we, we, uh, within that uh, project we are improving the livelihood of women farmers. Uh, the value chain is a very important aspect of that program. And access to better breeds, uh, finances, and market. And uh, I would like to, to add that this program has been experienced in other countries and, mm -hmm. and it was working. And now we are 
you know, we are leading this expansion of this program in Africa. Right. Very good. Mr. Sussman, uh, maybe you'd like to, to add a bit more. I mean, the program, as uh, uh, Mr. Khalifa has said, focuses on small entities. But these small entities on the African continent, as we know, are very important to ensuring the food security of their communities. I mean, 650 million people in Africa currently depend on um, rain-fed agriculture. What, what in ter as far as the Gates Foundation is concerned, what are you hoping this initiative will achieve? What areas do you want to focus on specifically? Yes, so, uh, well, first let me just uh, build on what you just said, which is the scale of the problem. Climate adaptation is such a technical word that we often lose focus on what it means underneath that, which is actually the deep impact right now mm -hmm. on hundreds of millions of human lives and livelihoods. Those smallholder farmers in Africa and in other parts of the world are already being faced with more erratic weather patterns, with heat, with greater heat, with more frequent floods, with more frequent droughts, which destroys crops, destroys livestock. And we know from the IPCC report and others that that heating is going to, Africa will heat by at least two more degrees over the next 20 years, no matter what happens uh, in terms of the wider mitigation efforts. So the need for efforts in this area are huge, and that's why, as the Gates Foundation, we've made it such a priority. Uh, with this new partnership with the Qatar Fund for Development, NANMO, we are trying to focus on both interventions that can make a difference right now. So uh, you heard uh, Bill Gates on there. You, know, you might not think of chickens as a tool for climate change, but in this case, our first investment in uh, so-called dual-use poultry is exactly that. These are poultry, which are largely used by women farmers, uh, we've uh, tested and piloted some of this work in countries like Ethiopia and Nigeria. We know it works. These are chickens that are more likely to survive those weather patterns. They can be used for both egg and meat. That provides both nutrition in households in real time for food security, and it provides additional income. That's a nice concrete case study of the kinds of interventions that can happen now, and that is one example of what we hope this fund will be able to do and catalyze. Uh, Secondly, though, we also need broader long-term investments in the actual agricultural research, that we know we need more drought and flood-resistant crops. We know we need better use. We know we need uh, better water use, excuse me, and irrigation and related issues. And so, again, our hope for this project is ambitious. I think it's a, it's a wonderful partnership. The Qatar Fund for Development and the government of Qatar uh, have shown a real commitment to climate adaptation as a broad issue. But uh, the effort has to be about much more than this project. This project will have, we hope, genuine catalytic impact, uh, will be transformative, but we also hope it actually it will crowd in others, other partners, other funders, uh, because the needs and the scale are much, much larger if we're going to address the uh, challenges we face. Thank you very much. And you're right to highlight, I think, that much of the climate discussion has focused on mitigation and adaptation is absolutely crucial. Maya, let me come to you now. Uh, the, the UN Secretary General, you know, after the release of the recent IPCC report, said, you know, had a very uh, strong message and a damning indictment of failed global leadership on climate change. How critical is it to have a global governance dimension in managing climate change and its related risks? And what are the challenges that those who are making decisions about climate adaptation face? Yes, indeed. Uh, the work of the Climate Governance Commission mm -hmm. has focused on what we see as a very fundamental, vital gap in, in our policy dialogue and narrative about how we strengthen our global governance of climate and ecological risk at the planetary level, but then, of course, connected to all levels of governance. So the mitigation and adapt adaptation challenges are just formidable <laughs> challenges. We just heard about the financing piece, right. and I'm very sympathetic to this suggestion about a mandatory mechanism, and this is exactly the kind of thinking mm -hmm. that we need to scale up our responses the com on the Commission, we've had uh, a range of, of, of proposals, different uh, pay policy papers 
on near-term global governance enhancements, more medium-term, longer-term, but with all of the accelerating impacts, mm -hmm. some of the longer-term <laughs> suggestions might become more um, uh, palatable to policymakers or indeed urgent to consider. Mm -hmm. For example, I heard from two former heads of state, uh, Australia and Canada, a suggestion, we need an IMF for the climate. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do we finance these extraordinary needs when things are happening so quickly on the ground and at scale, indeed? Yeah. And, and so, you know, after, after COP26 in Glasgow, we had pledge after pledge from rich countries. Is there currently a mechanism in place to make sure that countries keep that pledge? <laughs> no. Okay. So what then should be, so foreign minister, what, what then would you suggest that, that well, is put in place for these pledges to be kept, these promises that are made at each, they were made at Cancun, they were made in Glasgow and so on. How do we make sure governments keep these promises? I, I think that uh, we need to start to implement some kind of mandatory uh, mechanism by region. Mm. We in Latin America and Caribbean started, well, decide to establish an adaptation fund by ourselves. We are going to be 30 countries. And the, the issue here is, well, if Mexico and Argentina decide, well, we are producing much more uh, gas emissions, obviously, than the Caribbean countries, Indeed. which are at risk. So we need to put money in proportion and then to design several actions for adaptation in other countries, which are the Caribbean countries. So the manage of the, this fund with the money from Mexico, Argentina, and other countries is going to be held by a Caribbean country okay. with a technical support. So because if we wait for another global agreement about a mandatory, well, maybe we are going to no sé, mm -hmm. so wait another 10 years. So we don't but you're time. talking here about, I'm curious to know what is happening inside Mexico itself, because when, when, I, when you read the latest reports, I mean, after COP26, in, uh, COP16 rather, in Cancun, the Mexican state, for example, promised to generate 35% of its electricity uh, from renewable sources by 2024, which is in two years. But when you look at the climate action tracker, it's classifying your government's current efforts as critically insufficient, which is the worst category. Well, so we, we are going to, to reach 35 in, in 2024. Okay. Certainly. So uh, go ahead, finish your thought. <laughs> and we are investing right now in a hydroelectrics network of the country in order to increase the, the energy generation in the short term. Mm -hmm. And the, the goal is to have 35% in 2024. And then to have another goal. So our position is not to talk about 2060, but each government sh should fulfill their goals, which has been settled already. So we are going to fulfill this. Okay. okay. Well, what about when it comes to, sorry to, to, to ask you again, because there have been quite a few uh, reports on Mexico recently about Mexico not being a good student, especially when it comes to deforestation also. Uh, there, was, there was a pledge, and it's good to have you here so you can respond to some of these critics, you know. Sure. There was a pledge to stop deforestation by the year 2030, and yet 20,000 trees were cut down to make way for, for the construction of the Maya train project. Uh, it's not true. We, we demonstrate in the conversation. We have daily uh, press conference with the president, uh -huh. and he has those reports and questions. And we presented uh, the information about reforestation in the south of the country, especially counting on the Maya train, which is mainly an old train. Right. Or the high, the, the, the high road between Cancun and Tulum. So you cannot destroy the, the or deforest uh, areas because the the train already has been constructed a century ago. Okay. Well, let's hope your critics yes. hear that answer. And, and let me <laughs> add something. Uh, Mexico right now is financing the largest reforestation program in history mm -hmm. in Mexico. Okay. 400,000 people working on that, and it's a very important program, I think. All right. Thank you very much for responding to the question. Um, Mr. Khalifa, let's talk about the role of science, technology, and innovation, because I know that's something that the Qatar Fund for Development is, is very keen on, on pushing. 
um, the UN Sustainable Development Goal 2 aims to end hunger, of course. How can technologies address concerns related to food security? How can, can, they, can they help achieve some of these sustainable development goals? Uh, thank you for that. I think, you know, technology is the way that should facilitate our life and everything, and it has economic, economical benefits in different uh, uh, sectors and our, our aspects in our life. Same things when it comes to uh, uh, climate change impact uh, or uh, food security as well. There are plenty of uh, mechanisms that is available today uh, to uh, detect uh, natural disasters, detect uh, change in weather conditions before it comes. Mm -hmm. And those technologies are linked with different financial innovative financial mechanism where, my, for example, microfinancing for small farmers can be, can be put in a place to, to have a more holistic uh, approach and physic, fiscal uh, approach to, 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 the, to the government. And I think by doing that, you know, we know that as, as we established least developed can, uh, countries are affected the most, and climate change affects their uh, budget uh, mm -hmm. the most. Right. By having uh, a risk-based mechanism uh, linked to technology mm -hmm. uh, that can predict weather conditions. But what needs to be in place in, in terms of uh, the enabling environment in in, in that context you, and you, to other contexts. You, you will need strong political uh, commitment. Mm -hmm. You will need uh, policy. Uh, obviously, you will need strong international uh, mechanism as well to, to, to do that. But I believe that regardless of the international uh, mechanism, if there, is, if there are political commitment on the uh, country levels and if there are uh, the right policies uh, on the country levels, uh, if there are uh, regional movement, even if it's not uh, international movement, with the technologies available now, actually, the technology is available. I don't think that we are needing, we are waiting for that technology. It is available mm -hmm. and has been used in different fields. Maybe you will need to uh, know how to use, the, to use these technologies and uh, embed it in uh, bigger uh, structures. Right. Mr. Sussman, speaking of political um, commitment, right now governments around the world have been dealing with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course. So how, how do we make sure that that commitment remains when it comes to climate change? And what actions do you think can be practically considered by governments, especially in these low and middle income countries, to, to, to scale up their efforts and, and reduce the, the, the risks associated with climate change? Uh yeah, well, two uh, areas. One is at a global level. You know, the, the word, the phrase "global public good" is is often um, you're know, overused or thrown around at conferences like this. But what we really mean are, what are the goods that, if we invest in it, will clearly have a collective impact for the world that is positive, as well as for individual countries. So, at the uh, recent Glasgow COP summit. The Gates Foundation, along with a number of other countries, did announce a major set of investments in the CGIAR. That's another one of those acronyms, but it's uh -huh. the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. It's a coalition of agricultural research networks ranging from Africa to Asia to Latin America uh, that does core research into how do you actually make crops uh, more drought and flood resistant, more productive uh, in these things. Those are R&D investments that need to be made electively and that then can be rolled out across. The so that's one set of investments and while that's an encouraging number, it's still a fraction of what gets spent on some of the wider uh, energy and other uh, areas. And so we think that needs to radically increase, but it's a very important and mechanism where it's great to see some momentum. Then at the country level, what you do have, and country and regional level, is you do have some policy and resource prioritization coming from countries, trying to put more resources in. The, but you've got to connect those to what the right tools and interventions are. Mm -hmm. You might say, this is great, we should have a new kind of, uh, I'll use an example of 
uh, something that we have also helped support and fund in, in Africa and, and Gobi, which is new digital soil health mapping techniques, which use satellites to basically map out soil qualities across every part of Africa. And where you're, from that, you can have a much more targeted thing of how you use fertilizer, how you use irrigation, which crops you should use in that soil that are going to be more productive and more resilient. And you create that and you create networks within the governments for how to spread that. Too. So what you're doing is both increasing the allocation of resources mm -hmm. to agricultural development generally, but then you're providing these tools and techniques that are actually going to be uh, more robust and useful in terms of meeting adaptation needs and actually providing, again, the uh, food, nutrition, and income that those smallholder farmers need. All right, Maya, your thoughts about this? I mean, the world is developing cutting-edge technologies, of course, tools and best practices in, in, uh, uh, for climate uh, smart agriculture. But, you know, in Africa, I've seen it, having been there, a majority of farmers have limited access to, to critical resources, systems, and technologies. How, how do we connect global innovation? Uh, to local knowledge? How, how do we make sure that the solutions are inclusive and that those small holder farmers are not forgotten when these big decisions are being made at the global level? Yes, in, indeed. Um, and I think in the work in global governance, there, there's sometimes this false dichotomy about the local, from the local to the global, mm -hmm. and indeed they have to be intermeshed and, and, and mutually reinforcing and, and speaking, communicating with, with each other. And this sounds like an extraordinary uh, research uh, network and precisely the kind of initiative that is locally contexted. Mm -hmm. But then the problem is, of course, getting it to scale and accelerating the knowledge, making it uh, applicable and, and relevant for all the different geographic and, and localized uh, situations. So, you know, we have to get the, the, the global south, the, the very local um, voices into the conversation. For example, uh, I have colleagues uh, working on a regenerative agriculture project looking at uh, 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 small-scale farmers and who are practicing regenerative agriculture with the uh, carbon capture capacity, for example, and then using media to feature these stories of commercially viable uh, uh, regenerative agriculture. So I think there is also a lot of communications, media outreach, uh, and then, then how do we get that training to scale mm -hmm. uh, and, and that knowledge to scale? And then you need these different global governance levers. Right. Mr. Khalifa, I know you have to leave us very shortly because you have a signing ceremony, so I'll ask you one one or two more questions before I bring in our audience if you have uh, question for, questions for our panelists here. Um, you know, when it comes to, to scaling action and investment, uh, Qatar, of course, is, is doing quite a lot on the African continent. What do you see uh, as the challenges and what advice would you give to countries who, who want to, you know, follow in your, in, in your footsteps, not to perhaps make the same mistakes if, as you've done? I would think that we need to, to follow a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, we mentioned the very uh, uh, answer the question of mitigation, but adaptation it is safe living to uh, safe uh, safe life saving today, and it's a livelihood for the uh, people today. And those things, you know, those people cannot wait for us to um, to work on the uh, the mitigation right. process. Uh, countries in, in 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 Africa and the Middle East. Uh, at the edge of famine, uh, Somalia, you mentioned earlier, where we, it's not only the people, but the, their source of food is dying, like their uh, animals are dying. And mm -hmm. Things like in, in, in Yemen, uh, where people like, uh, with, with the conflict and uh, uh, COVID and the exactly. economic downturn. And I think we need to take actions today, uh, especially, in, and this is what we mean by adaptation, is is to try to take action today and list the uh, action of the mitigation mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, took place. And I would think that one of the most important things that uh, we are doing, and I think it's working very well, is building partnership and not mm -hmm. to reinventing the wheels and trying to scale up what works. Right, scale up what works. Foreign Minister Ibrad, uh, what action can be taken today Again, we are living in a, well, not quite post-pandemic world yet. Some would say we're still in the middle of it. But Western governments now have other priorities. They're focusing on their own countries. You know, there's a certain isolationism 
that's come about as a result of this crisis. How do we convince Western governments to help these countries that are the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change? Well, I think that uh, this, this kind of forest, the activism between uh, the public opinion all over the world can be decisive in the short term, mm -hmm. uh, as, as was in the past. Without this kind of activism, like this kind of forest or other uh, network all over the world, we didn't have the COP in Paris or, or any advance. So it's clear that we have the disasters already uh, in our door. We need to act immediately. It uh, can be done with a mandatory mechanisms. All the way, we are not going to have the scale or we are going to do it in 20 or maybe 30 years, which is going to be highly costly for several countries. So we have the problem right now, and we have the pressure from the public opinion, international public opinion, already. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can do it in the, sh in the short term. In the short term. Mr. Sussman, are, are you as optimistic as a, a foreign minister? He says we can do it in the short term. There are just, what, eight or nine agricultural seasons left until the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goals target. Are you as optimistic, and what solutions do you see can be funded immediately now? Uh, yes, so there's a difference between we can and we will. We certainly can. Th those are the commitments. Uh, they, we have the science. We have uh, the technology. We have some of the models of uh, things that we can scale. I've given you some concrete examples of investments. You know, it's great that uh, the Qatar Fund for Development and we are making that investment that I talked about, but you know, that investment could be scaled up many times by, uh, with other funders who might want to come in. There are equivalents uh, that you can do across many different crops uh, investments, and those needs are going to be much more acute in the short term because of, as you alluded to at the front, the growing uh, food security crisis given the spike in fertilizer prices and others coming from the Ukraine war, which will have significant short-term impact. We also uh, know that while definitely there has been a much greater increase in focus on both mitigation and adaptation, and adaptation did play a bigger role in the Glasgow COP than it has uh, in many previous ones, we know it is also the orphan child still of the climate discussion and debate. The fraction of resources that goes into climate adaptation is still a tiny proportion of that goes into mitigation. Yet it's the needs, when you talk about right now, mm -hmm. it is these communities, as you heard from Bill Gates at the start, this is uh, Africa's economy contributed 5% to global emissions, and yet it's disproportionately affected in a way that you know, fundamentally affects lives and livelihoods by the reality of climate change today. And that is true across other parts of the developing world, across Asia, Latin America uh, as well. And so, uh, yes, uh, we are always at the Gates Foundation optimistic about what can be done. Mm -hmm. Our role as a foundation is to try and identify the investments and the products and the technologies that can be scaled in partnership and they get full local ownership. Uh, but the reality is the level of resources and political will and commitment being shown and addressed to adaptation mm. is far short of what is needed right now. Okay. Maya. Uh, I'll give you the last word before we bring in our audience. When you have other issues like governance, poverty, and now the coronavirus pandemic, it becomes difficult for climate action plans to, to work because governments, especially in, in low- and middle-income countries in Africa, they have other priorities. How do we bridge the gap? Yeah, I, I think uh, every country, indeed, uh, needs support at this moment for, for these intersecting risks and challenges. So we have to think in multiple dimensions, but fortunately, a lot of the solutions for climate adaptation and mitigation are also good economic decisions. Mm -hmm. They're good for our future. For example, the Global Commission on Adaptation notes that you know, if 1.8 trillion globally invested in adaptation from 2020 to 2030 will generate 7.1 trillion in net benefits down the road. And we know this, that similar figures for, for, for mitigation efforts. So these are good economic investments, but uh, you know, the point made about not reinventing the wheel. Countries have to learn from each other. We have to scale up the knowledge, the technology. We have to, to find the, the, 
the proper platforms to share the technology. And, 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 and one of our proposals was a global policy clearinghouse mm -hmm. where countries can come together like a, a super platform of innovation so that indeed like the, 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 the best policies for mitigation and adaptation can be, can be diffused and scaled <laughs> around the world and there can be this innovative mindset of learning from each other and, and, and accelerating action. But I think from my experience, governments absolutely need such a lot of support at the moment, both on the policy front, of course, financial, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to make sure we have the infrastructure in place to provide that support. All right. Thank you all very much. I know Mr. Khalifa has to leave us very soon. Thank you so much for taking part in this session. I'd like to open the floor now to questions from the audience, if there are any. Uh, the gentleman in the front row, please. Just st uh, stand by. Somebody's going to bring you a microphone. Hello. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Ebrard about uh, if he can explain further how does this uh, fund for Latin America works and all the panelists, uh, whether you consider this could be a solution to do like regional funds. Okay. Well, well, Minister. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly. Well, it's, it's just a uh, first year of ex experimentation in order to present as a region a mandatory mechanism design and put in place in our region. Instead of just have a political discussion each COP, mm -hmm. asking for where is the money. So uh, we started the discussions. Let me present the, the conclusions. Uh, each country which is going to be part of this mechanism should have a contribution accordingly with their emissions. Is the first place. In the second place, you have an independent technical uh, team which uh, should decide what kind of investment is going to be made with the money and in which countries, mainly in the countries uh, in danger because of the climate change. Uh, and in the case of the, our region, is those are the Caribbean countries, the islands in the Caribbean basin. So it's going to work by a year, maybe around $60 billion. And then we are going to present this in the COP as a possible way to make this kind of mechanism uh, mandatory, as a proposal for the rest of the world, mainly United States, European Union, China, and other countries, mm -hmm. which should take the same approach. Because of the way, there are no, no exit to this discussion. We, we spent more than, I, I remember the first, I was the mayor of the city. I presented the climate action plan of the city in 2009. And we spent all the COPs between 2009 and 2021, and we don't have the money. Mm. So we need to start it some way. Sure. It needs this to is it. Yeah. Any other questions? One more. Uh, just briefly, uh, Mr. Sussman, how do you see such a proposal, the one that the Mexican government is considering right now, how do you see it going down with, uh, with the biggest images, the big countries and, and, and the rich countries? Will, they, will this be something that they'll be on board with? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> as the Gates Foundation, you know, we work around our specific projects and areas of expertise. You know, uh, what I can do is simply state the commitments the governments have made themselves in multiple forums, including about significantly larger amounts of resources that should be going to adaptation, that should be funding the Green Climate Fund, which has a 50% mandate to spend 50% of its resources on adaptation as well as mitigation, and where resources have fallen far short of earlier commitments. And so uh, the question is, yes, they should. They have committed to it, but in Will the they? context that you're talking about, yeah. um, you know, that is for each national government to you know, make the decision whether they do, but certainly to the point that uh, you just heard, one thing is clear is it's not just a payment, it is an investment that actually will generate very tangible returns, mm -hmm. uh, both economic returns and returns in terms of human lives and livelihoods, so they certainly should be making it. Okay, we'll take one more question. Gentleman in the back with the glass. Oh, late. oh sorry, ma'am. I, I see you, you have the microphone, I didn't see you. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Jane Madrick from Wetlands International. Uh, I want to reflect on the fact that uh, in Senegal, the World Water Forum is meeting now. One of the issues on the table 
uh, is how to better connect land and water management. And I'm struck by the lack of reference by this panel to water and the need to bring land and water management together and to restore water-related ecosystems to tackle the fundamental issue of land degradation and also as a basis for building smallholder farmers' livelihoods. So I'd, I'd like to hear some comment. Um, I think it's equally true for Africa and Mexico, this issue. Absolutely, Thank you. absolutely. Water, water resources. Uh, perhaps, Mr. Khalifa, you want to address that? Okay. Maya? Yes, I mean, there's a whole set of adaptation uh, uh, measures we have to take. Water is absolutely fundamental, and thankfully also in the water area, there's been growing momentum around discourse and high, at the highest levels, but it's also obviously another very contexted local uh, kind of issue. But for, for all of these, uh, you know, water-related or connecting land water, like investment in mangrove protection, for example, which was a key uh, proposal from the Global Commission on Adaptation, these, these, these have to be implemented at the national and then local level. They have to, there has to be sound policies, there have to be planning. Uh, so, for example, um, this global policy clearinghouse we, we talked about would be one kind of forum uh, to talk about these, these like very fundamental strategies for, for adaptation measures, those key measures related to land, water, um, other natural features. Um, also, one, one very important governance uh, mechanism that is, uh, we feel, vital to connect the, the, the international to the national, be it for adaptation mitigation, is a, a national climate policy council with, with scientific advice, with multifaceted uh, interdisciplinary advice for, so that every country can mainstream adaptation and mitigation planning and strategy at the national level. And of course, that there needs to be funding support and then again, getting in, in, in the local voices. Um, so, so we think, again, connecting these policy dialogues and these core insights uh, have, to, have to be scaled up and taken to an, another level. Hmm. All right. Uh, one more question. Yes, the gentleman in the back, please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Said Qasim Suleiman. I'm from Frida Global Organization. We mainly work and support survivors of uh, sexual violence and conflicts, and, and in this case, Yazidi survivors of ISIS um, captivity. My question to His Excellency, uh, Mr. Khalifa, and also to Kate Foundation, after he have seen uh, Yazidis and other minorities, including um, Shabak Muslims, including Christians in Iraq, have faced these genocide crimes, and this has been also internationally recognized as genocide crimes and war mm -hmm. crimes, crimes against humanity. Seven years passed, still the majority of Yazidis, in this case in um, Zinjar, they cannot go back to their area. Is Qatar Foundation for Development and Gate Foundation have any um, plans for a, a small fund to rebuild this area? Right. And because survivors of sexual violence in this case, not only suffering from trauma, but also suffering from climate change, uh, in this area specifically, mm. and they are twice again victims. Thank you very much, and I hope there will be an initiative, even if a small fund, that these areas will be rebuilt, people will be able to go back to their homes. Thank you very okay. much. Well, um, the focus of our, our panel is, well, uh, Mr. Khalifa, maybe you want to uh, touch on... You are rightly... Uh, uh, mentioned the, the, the tragedy that, that happened there, and, uh, and we acknowledge that. And uh, usually, as, as a donor, we work with the, with the government, and we work based on uh, national government priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, at one point, a discussion and a project that we were planning, but the things, uh, because of, of uh, different uh, COVID and other things, that slowed down. But may, this is something that uh, we would like to, to help and work on. Thank you. Uh, I think we, we, we are running out of time. Thank you so very much to all of you, all four of you, for taking part in this uh, session at this year's Doha Forum, which is now Kerbin.
carbon neutral, a carbon neutral Doha Forum, the very first carbon neutral Doha Forum. I think the organizers need a, a round of applause for that. Thank you all very much once again, and thank you for the interesting questions. There are three more sessions that are about to begin very shortly that I invite you to go to the governing uh, the global climate crisis, the new frontier session, powering the creative economy to drive economic development, and aggression against Ukraine session. Thank you all very much.